days till Easter. And we want to in, involve ourselves in a three-part series leading up to Easter to learn how to invest, intercede, invest, and invite our friends to be a part of that worship service, but also beyond that to help bring people to Christ. So we have an I3 strategy here, and we want to challenge all of you at all three campuses to identify three people, I3 for three people, this year that you can invest your life in after you've interceded for them, then invite them to the cross of Christ, invite them to that particular relationship, which changes all eternity, changes their lives forever. So the first one is today, intercede, then next week invest, then invite. I was thinking, who would be the best person to teach on intercede, on learning how to pray for those three friends this next year that we can have the joy of bringing to Christ? My wife, Marilyn, uh, my wife of 34 years almost, it's hard to believe. When I've been down, she's picked me up. When I've needed encouragement, she has given me that encouragement. She is my best friend. She's also written a book entitled Sometimes He Whispers, Sometimes He Roars. It's a book about prayer. And she understands this subject. I thought it'd be great to hear from her. She does this several times, once or two times a year. She did it for me this weekend, guys. I asked her to, okay? It's my pleasure to introduce you to my wife, Marilyn. Would you thank her for coming? I'm going to pray, and we'll get started, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, would you identify those three people who don't know you? Three people that we could, this next year, be used to bring into your kingdom. For all the joys of this world are stunted when we think about the absolute joy of affecting somebody else's eternity. Be with Marilyn. Thank you for her life and our life together. Thank you for her knowledge of prayer, something she's studied for literally decades. Now use your wisdom in her to impart to us how to intercede for those who don't know you. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Amen. And I can assure David that he has a lot of job security. I'm not going to be fighting him for this job. Um, I think you guys would be amazed at how this man has been able to pull sermons together for over 30 years. He does a Tuesday night Bible study, has a radio show. It's just amazing. And I'm going to talk some a little bit in my message about one of the reasons I think he's able to do that. But first of all, I just want to say this is a praying church. Forest Hill, with all the things that are woven into our DNA... You know, we talk a lot about our heart for the poor. We talk a lot about our heart for the lost. But much more quietly, I just want to assure you that from the very beginning, prayer has been woven tightly and quietly into the DNA of Forest Hill. In fact, when that pulpit committee, the group that called David and me to Forest Hill, gosh, over 30 years ago, called us, there had been a small group, some of whom are still in the church even to this day, that prayed for nine months that God would bring somebody that had a passion for the Word of God. And I'll tell you, when we walked in those doors and met the people at Forest Hill, this was back in 1980, we didn't want to go anywhere else. We didn't look at another church. And I'm here today, I feel privileged and honored to be invited by David and Jonathan as part of this I3 team to really bring to you the challenge to ask yourself, what can I do to be a praying person? Because if you remember David's sermon a couple weeks ago when he talked about how he boldly went into Coach Smith's office at the University of North Carolina and said, hey, Coach, what can I do to be a better uh, teammate? How can I make the Tar Heels better? You might remember Coach Smith's answer to David, and he said this. He said, well, David, become a better player. And I want to say to you that as we talk about all these great things that we hope God is going to do in the years ahead of Forest Hill, What we have to say to ourselves first, quietly, is if I want Forest Hill to be a church that builds God's church on earth, I need to become a better prayer. And so to that end, I wanted to share with you some thoughts that I have tonight. I feel like like today, in this day and time right now, with the world as shaky as it is, God is saying to all of his church, I want you to pray, pray deeply for my broken people all around the world. I want you to listen and pray for people that you may have never met. I want you to pray for me to break your heart for the things that break mine. And if you do that, which has been my personal experience and kind of my experiment of the last decade, I promise you God will shake your life up in a new way, in a great way, and it will be the beginning of a wonderful adventure. So with that, let's kind of take off here because I think that I want to start out first by saying I've given this message to the ladies 
If you were here at Women Under Construction in the fall, you will have heard a lot of this, but what I really have a heart for today is you guys. Because I think God is calling guys to pray today. I think men sometimes think prayer is women's work. You know, it goes on in the closet and the quiet rooms when nobody's watching and they think it's a little dull. And I think really God is saying today, guys, he wants to shake you up. You know, Paul said it to Timothy, I want men everywhere to raise up holy hands in prayer. And that wasn't like pious hands, that was really more like warfare hands because if you go to Psalm 144, King David said it in a different way. He said, God, you have trained my fingers for battle and my hands for war. It was a military term. So I think I want to issue a challenge to you guys today, kind of in a quiet way, but I really want to prod your heart to say, could, could God be calling me to pray in a bolder way? You know, I include in my book quite a number of military images, and my publishers said, you know what, ladies are not going to read that book with military imagery. And I'm like, but it's in the Bible. Paul talks about the fight of faith. You know, it is not a calm and a tame thing to be a Christian. And so I had to work really hard with all the editors that put their two cents worth in, and I was able to keep every single military image. And I think it's important for us to realize that prayer really is one of the ways that we wage war as Christians. So it's not a tame thing. So I want to say to you guys, you know, it's a guy thing. It's a guy thing. And I know a thing or two about guys because I'm married to one, and I've raised two. I have a daughter, too. Now I have a son-in-law. And I've kind of made it my little personal project to study guys, okay? Because watching my daughter grow up and watching my boys grow up, I was intrigued by just the relational dynamics of when they played with friends. The girls would interact with each other, and there was always drama. You know, there were conflicts, and they were, you know, interacting and relating to one another. And sometimes they played with toys, but they always played with one another. And you know what my guys did? It was so simple. They played with each other with stuff. And as long as there were toys, you're nodding your head, as long as there were toys, everybody was happy. And so one day, I think my youngest was about seven at the time, and I was traveling a, on one of our many, many, many carpool rides across town, and I thought I was just going to give this kid a reality check. You know, I wanted to see where toys were and his importance of life. So I said, Michael, let's think about the things that you need to live. Okay, we need food and we need water. We need shelter, clothes, maybe some toys. Where would you rank order those? You know, I was kind of throwing a little Maslow's hierarchy of needs in there. And um, so he said, quite smartly, well, Mom, everybody knows you need water first. I said, good, 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 Michael. And I said, well, what would come second? And he said, oh, shelter, shelter. And I said, good, that's good. And then I said, well, what comes third? And he said, third is toys. And I said, well, Michael, oh, what about food? He goes, Mom, didn't you know a boy cannot live without toys? And so I'm sitting here going, okay, this has raised a good child here. And then he added this, which I thought was rather smart. He said, and besides, don't you know, a lot of toys come with food. So this is a child that obviously had had one too many Happy Meals. <laughs> but he is pretty smart. You know, most toys these days for kids come with food. So I want to tell you about the one too many Happy Meals for this child that almost cost me my life. It is my survivor story, and I want to ask for a show of hands of you out there, do any of you have in your history a near-death experience? Who here has had a brush with death? A brush with death, okay, a number of hands. It was a brush with death, but it obviously wasn't death because you're still here and you're still breathing. My brush with death came about when I was the dutiful mother trying to get a happy meal for my child on the way to the beach. And we stopped off at the Burger King in Wadesboro, on Highway 74, that morning, went in to get it, came back out, and I'm out in the parking lot motioning to this very cooperative, usually, four-year-old to come on, we're in a hurry, Michael, we're going to the beach. He's just standing there with his little Happy Meal on the curb. And all of a sudden, I realized why, because at that split second, I was hit very hard from behind by a minivan. And what's so interesting is I knew it was a minivan. It's funny what you think about when you're about to die, you know? I knew that it was a minivan because it hit my head and my back all at the same time. Somehow I knew it was a woman, and I knew that she didn't know I was back there. And so here's the thought that went through my mind. You better scream, and you better scream loudly, which is kind of funny because I'm not a screamer. So in that little split second, I made myself scream bloody murder. There's my child there the whole time. This woman stops, but not before she rolls all the way over me. You know, part of my body is up underneath the van, and then part of it is out. 
And obviously I survived, I'm here to tell about it. But I rushed up, you know, crawled out from under the van, rushed up, bruised and bleeding. Now, what do you think my first thought was? Michael, where's my four-year-old? Yes, where's my four-year-old? So I rushed over to this little trembling child on the curb. By this time, all the bystanders had gathered around. You know, they wanted to take me off to the uh, emergency room. And the, the uh, rescue squad in Wadesboro at that time was a pickup truck. <laughs> so I was like, guys, you know, thanks, but no thanks. They bandaged me up. And it's interesting because at that moment, I was more concerned about getting my child comforted and off to the beach than I was about myself. And it's interesting, after that experience, I read a little research by a, a journalist named Lawrence Gonzalez. And Gonzalez has done decades of research into what he calls deep survival. Some of you may have read some of his articles, but he says this. He actually has lots of things that people do to survive a disaster, and the things that people do who survive and the things that people do who don't and boil down into three simple steps. Three simple steps. The people that survive basically do three things. They breathe, then they organize, and then they act. And if you think about it, that's what I did when the van hit. It hit me hard from behind, and what did I do? I breathed for a minute, and I said, uh-oh, I've just been hit by a minivan. And secondly, I said, she doesn't know you're back here, so scream, that was my organizing. And then my action was, what, to scream. And scream loudly, bloody murder, as a matter of fact. And he added a fourth thing, and he said this, you know, the other thing that determines how they do long term is if they're able to get outside of themselves and care for somebody else. And isn't that interesting that in my caring for Michael, I probably helped myself recover a little bit, didn't I? So instead of driving home, which most sensible people would do when they were plowed over by a minivan, I turned left and continued onto the beach because I was determined to give my child that day at the beach. But the survival instincts are interesting because the whole thing crept in again less than a year later in the scenario that knocked all of America to our knees, and that was 9-11. And that's really the beginning of my prayer journey that I want to share with you today. God is calling his church to pray. He has been since the church was formed. God is calling his church to pray more than ever because of all that's going on. He's calling Forest Hill to pray because of the size of our mission. But in my life, the call to pray in a new way came on that day of 9-11. I was in my home, like many of you, watching the Twin Towers crumble. How many times did we watch that over and over and over till I just couldn't take it anymore? Went out to the quiet of my car, which is where I sometimes go when I want to hear God, and just sat there with this Bible for a really long time saying, God, what do you do? when the end looks near. I mean, we didn't know at that point, is this the end of the world? Is this the end of safety as we knew it? It was certainly the end of the security that as we knew it in our country. What do you do? And I really sensed God saying something to me very quietly. Marilyn, it's really important right now to listen to my second voice. And I was like, did I just imagine that? It wasn't audible. And he said, I feel like it was almost like Elijah. It's like he was saying to me, I want you to hear my second voice, not the voice of panic, but the voice that's a whisper. And I almost kind of stopped for a minute. I opened up to 1 Peter 4, 7 and read these words, which I'll never forget, and it said this, the end of all things has come near, it was in my translation, therefore be self-controlled and alert so you can pray. And that's my paraphrase, that's the way I memorized it. But that self-controlled and alertness was such an odd thing for me to associate with prayer because what do you normally think of when you think of prayer? Passion, fervor, commitment, dedication, but whoever thinks of something as boring as self-control, something as, as really intentional as alertness. And so I felt like God was taking me on this journey and he, and he quietly said, if you'll just listen to me, I'll show you what to do. And so I followed it with this thought. It was more of a prayer. And I said, God, I'm just one woman. I'm not an ambassador. I'm not a military personnel. What can I do? What can I do to help the safety of our world? And it was followed by this. I want you to pray. And then I followed this with my own prayer. God, I wonder what would happen if I began to pray for your whole world. Now, isn't that a ridiculous thing? Isn't that a tall order? What would happen if I prayed for the world, it's almost random now when I think about it. Who ever says, God, I'll pray for the world, except people who talk about world peace, you know? You never really get much more specific than that. But I, in my heart, knew that he was calling me to pray for the world. And I sensed him saying this, you need to do it one country at a time. So just a month after that, 
here I am with this idea of being alert. I'm listening. I'm watching more carefully for ways to pray. Let me just parenthetically say that John Wesley's followers just centuries ago had a discipline of watching. Isn't that interesting? That's one of the things he schooled them to do as they were followers for him, is he helped them understand the discipline of watching. So I'm watching, I'm alert, I'm listening. Soon after, about a month after 9-11, I read an article in the newspaper that changed my life, and it talked about what was happening in the nation of the Sudan. It talked about the two decades of genocide, the two million people that were killed, a couple of more million people were displaced, and I was like, where has this been? Why didn't I know about this? And I wrote in my journal, God, how could I have not known that my Christian brothers and sisters on the other side of the world were being slaughtered by the millions? Where has this been? And so I decided that I would begin praying for them. Now, let me just say this. We were all really worried still a month after 9-11. Do you remember? You just felt, you felt for your family. You felt for your friends. You felt for your nation. And so what I began to start doing is listing all my concerns. And so I wrote a list with all my friends, my family members, my neighbors. Then I said to myself, I'm going to start putting on the list the people that are outside of my sphere. So on Monday, that's the first day of the week. That was the day that I prayed for David. So it's a really big, big prayer from a big, tall husband. And then I also put on that Monday the nation of the Sudan after reading that article. So Mondays, it was a big guy, a big need, a big country, the Sudan, other people that were close to me. Every Monday for weeks and months, just prayed for the Sudan. Well, you know what? After a while of being watchful and alert and listening, praying specifically for the Sudan, it got a little dull. Can you imagine praying for a country like that? Psalm 5.3 says this, Morning by morning we lay our requests before you, God, and eagerly watch for the answers. Well, I was watching for the answers, and I really wasn't seeing anything. How do you pray for a country and know whether your prayers are hitting a bullseye, Right? So I said, God, help me understand this. And I said, I need to be able to put a name and a face on this nation. So you know what I started doing? I started praying for some random guy in the nation of Sudan. Now you have to understand this place is as big, or was at that time before it was divided, as the entire United States east of the Mississippi. So I'm praying for a nation called the Sudan and a random guy named Sudan Sam. And that's what I did on Mondays, just for about a minute over time. Well, let me fast forward. Here I am praying alert. I'm asking specifically. Fast forward a few years later. What did David and I do but have the opportunity to travel to the Sudan? Remember when we had that, that campaign and we took up all the donations for the Sacks of Hope? I never thought I would go there. They invited me to go, and I'm thinking, like, Lord, all I wanted to do was pray for the Sudan. I didn't want to go, you know? But how can I not? I've been praying for this country now for years. So we go with Samaritan's Purse. We deliver the sacks of hope. We're in a very remote, remote region called the Nuba Mountains, which is in the news again now. There's turbulence right now in the Nuba Mountains again. We meet our interpreter. We have a really nice dinner one night with all the people gathered around talking about how we all became interested in this area and aren't we privileged to be here and see God's people who had suffered so much for their faith. The people there, it is a genocide. They're being massacred for the color of their skin and for their Christian faith. And I heard these stories, and then I said to the people as we were sharing while we were there, I said, well, you know, I've been praying for the Sudan. I'm even, ha-ha, I've been playing for, this, praying for this random guy named Sudan Sam. And our interpreter looked at me quietly, and he said, Sudan Sam, that's me. And I said, that can't be you. Your name is Zaki. And he says, my name is Zaki Samuel, which is Samuel in Arabic. And he said, what's more, my father is named Samuel, and there's a book written about him called Sam of the Sudan. And all of a sudden, Sudan Sam is right there in front of me, and the days and the weeks and the months of praying for Sudan Sam, and let's see if we can see a picture of Sudan. Actually, let's go back one. Sudan Sam, Sam of the Sudan, first convert in that region, and God had put, imagine this, the God of the universe that made the mountains and the universe and the world and all that had whispered to me enough to put the name of Sudan Sam on my heart and to pray for years. So I'm thinking, this is a little eerie, God. You know, you are unveiling these countries before my eyes. Before the journey was over, David and I ended up in the office of the president, now the president of South Sudan, Republic of Sudan. We ended up in the office of another African president, and I said, you know, I've got to get this stuff on paper. This is really crazy. I started thinking, it's like, God, you really are listening. You made the whole world, you made the universe, but you were talking to me. 
this is insane. You know, you start to talk to yourself thinking, am I crazy? And so the thing happened again. This whole scenario played itself out another time. I was sitting in church one day. It was the Sunday where we celebrate the international persecuted church. And very simply flashed on the screen were three or four different people who were persecuted Christians around the world. And I saw up there the name of uh, another Sam, Sam Lam from China, Reverend Sam Lam from China. And a little blurb about him, how he was in prison as part of the house church movement, in prison for 20 years. All he asked for was not freedom, not prosperity, not to be re reunited with his family. All he asked for were three things, revival and strength for his people and fruit in his witnessing. And so I thought, I can do that. I can put him on my list. And so he made my Thursday list. This went on for months, praying for Sudan, I mean, for uh, China's Sam Lamb. Never thought I'd meet him, never thought I'd see his face. Well, when you know, one day, David had a book, I think, over on his desk. And then there was a magazine on top of that, and it was Christian history and biography. And I must tell you, it's a pretty dry magazine. And I picked it up, and I thought, like, yeah, who's going to read this? And then I noticed on the front it said, China's persecuted house church. And I thought, well, you know, I've been praying for this Sam Lamb for years for revival, strength, and fruit. I probably won't ever see him until I get to heaven, but wouldn't it be interesting if I ever could find out what happened to him? And I opened up the magazine, and it fell open to this face. And this face looked up at me, and I want you to see the face. The face looked up at me, and for a split second, a freeze-frame moment, I thought, no way, that couldn't be Reverend Sam Lamb in China, could it? And so I read the body of the magazine. It was buried way down in there, and it got to the point of describing who that was. It was Reverend Sam Lamb in China, who had just been released after 20 years in prison and is now pastor of one of the largest churches in China. And I just could not believe it. I saved that because I'm thinking, God has connected my heart now to another guy halfway around the world. This is really getting weird. So I started continuing to take notes, as you can imagine, wondering where, where God would have this journey. And not everything was far away from home. I want to share with you one more story because another incident happened that really has significance for you because I think you got a card when you came in about the 21-day experiment in faith. Well, I want to share with you a little story about what happened with that in response to prayer. Lest you think that prayer only takes you to Africa or connects you to China, I want you to see that the God that made all of this also made this, which is your heart, your faith, your personal walk. We've talked about the importance of being alert in prayer, about asking specifically, and let me just show you how detailed this God of the universe can be, okay? I was on a retreat with some women at Forest Hill, which is kind of interesting because our guys just came back from their retreat, and we've got a women's retreat coming up. I can't remember where we were in our ministry. All I know is that I was extremely tired, and we had had a lot going on, and there was just a sense of, God, are you really listening? And wouldn't you know, as I'm praying, you know, for the things going on at Forest Hill, I start seeing pennies everywhere. And y'all are really going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this story. But I start seeing pennies everywhere. You know, I would pull out my shoes to put on a shoe, and there'd be a penny in my shoe. Or I'd make my bed up and pull the pillow up to fluff it, and there was a penny under my pillow. Or I'd pick up a glass, you know, out of my cabinet to put on the table, and there was a penny there. I mean, it was really pennies in places where they shouldn't have been. Does that make sense? And a friend of mine, her son had a broken arm. I started telling my friends about this. My, her son had a broken arm. When they took his cast off, there was a penny plastered to his arm. So I thought, this is really interesting. God, are you really talking to me through pennies? Does this really mean that you are caring for somebody as small and insignificant as me on planet Earth? Well, kept finding the pennies. I was on this retreat, and I told my friend on the retreat about that story with the pennies. I said, Kenna, isn't this strange? I'm finding pennies everywhere. Well, time went on. Came back from the retreat, and I launched into an experiment that I do from time to time. Uh, Zach up here earlier was talking about an experiment. I am big on experiments. And I launched into an experiment that I do from time to time when my faith needs a little charge. And you have a copy of that there. It's called the 21 day experiment from the Gospel of John. And you just read a chapter a day of John. There are 21 days. It takes 21 days, they say, to form a habit. And it's a great way to start to jumpstart your love for God's word. And for some reason, I think it's because John wrote the Gospel of John to build our faith. 
I never do that experiment that it doesn't just really fire me up in some way. So I came back all charged up from that retreat, and I was going to read through the 21 days of John, which I began to do. Well, on day 20, this is Jesus appearing to his disciples, and it said on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus basically came to them and said, Peace, you know, I'm okay. I want you to look at my hands. There are the nail, nail holes here, but um, I'm alive, and this is all great. And this is they were overjoyed. And then he says to him, Peace, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. And that's just one of the times he is sending them out. He told them over and over and over like he's telling us. Go, go, tell my people, you know, like, like we were saying earlier, tell people the name of Jesus. They need to know me. Tell them my name. Tell them I love them. I, I want you to help me save the earth, okay? So, so basically, they're all happy about this, but the one guy that didn't show up was Thomas. He missed that first showing. And it says here, now, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And this is where it began to mean something to me. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Do you ever feel like that? Like, Lord, I am so dry. I am so desperate for your voice that I'm almost comparing myself to doubting Thomas. I want to see the nail hole in your hand. And a week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them, and through the door, though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them. I think he was showing off again, coming in through the locked doors. He says, peace with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers right here and see my hands. Reach out and take your hand and put it into my side. Thomas, stop doubting and believe. At that point, I closed my Bible, and I said quietly to God, you know, God, I don't know why I'm at that point right now of, of doubting and having the need to really see you more closely. I want to see how much you care for me, and I really want to see the nail holes in your hand, just like Thomas did. I want the nail holes in your hand. I don't know how you're going to do it, but that's my prayer. Well, the next day in the mail, I get a card from my friend Kenna, whom I had shared the story with about the pennies. And I want you to see the card that Kenna sent me. And what she said was, I found this penny in the dryer, and I think God sent it your way, my, well, my way as an encouragement to us both. Love, Kenna, but that's a penny with a nail hole right through the center of it. At the bottom, she put, wonders never cease. Well, you know, obviously I saved that thing because when I get discouraged, when I wonder if God hears my prayers, I just remind myself he can send a penny with a nail hole to a doubting Thomas like me or you. He made the universe, he made the mountains, but he can also stoop down and do things so small as to answer our prayers. You know, God wants us to pray for the world. I truly believe that. He's calling us to pray for this broken world. David is always talking about this prayer that he prays, that's such a dangerous prayer. God, break my heart for the things that break yours. But he also says this, I want to know you by name. I want you to know me by name. I want you to pray because that's how we stay connected. God is calling his people, his church, to pray for a hurting and broken world, and it starts here. The third step I learned was to pray with biblical authority, and I won't go through these steps in a lot of detail right now because what I really want you to focus on is the calling to reach the lost. Intercede, invest, and invite. But these steps of action that I think are pretty simple will keep you grounded, and when you pray God's word and pray with biblical authority, there is no telling what can happen. David and I learned that early on in our marriage. And when we were going through all those years of infertility, we found that if we could find a promise from God's word, and you know, when you're reading his word and you ask the Holy Spirit to light up a verse for you, just say this, God, speak to me through your word and impress something on my heart that's straight from you. He will. And, and often when you're going through a trial or a challenge and you need that word from God, it's amazing how he can give you just what you need at the moment. Remember when he, we read, uh, we'd read, he settles the barren woman in her home, the happy mother of children. And I would just claim that verse. Or, or for our children, we would claim Psalm 112 that says, your children will be mighty in the land. And there's something about standing on God's word and holding fast to those promises that gives, I think, like a turbocharge to our prayers. 
Next step of prayer that I think is important for us to do, we're going to be alert, we're going to pray with, uh, be specific, we're going to pray with authority. Fourth, is to agree with others in prayer. And I will say that that prayer of agreement is another way for you to see the turbocharge of God's power. Um, that word, it says, for agreement, if two or three agree as touching the same thing, my Father in heaven will do that for them. That's Jesus' words. And that word for agree, two words in the Greek, sim and phone, similar voice, pray with one voice. I don't know why there's more uh, power when people pray together, but I will say this, if it starts in marriage, that's the best place for it to happen. When a family prays together, there is no stronger force on earth. And if your kids see you praying together and they start to notice answer to prayer, you'll know you've hit a home run when they start calling you and saying, will you pray for me? I'm seeing it work in your life. Will you pray for me? So agree with others in prayer. Fifth, arm yourself with spiritual strength. You will read and hear a lot about how to be strong with God's armor, and I have no problem with that. I think we need the armor of God. I think there is a power that we can't understand that, that God gives to us when we fight the powers of darkness. But you know, a lot of times, friends, we try to be so heavenly-minded when it comes to warfare and prayer that we forget that we are flesh and blood, and we forget that God wants to discipline our bodies. And, and I told you earlier, one of the things I've watched with David over the years and how he's been able to sustain ministry and preaching for so long, is he has taken Paul seriously. When Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he said, I, I discipline my body to make it my servant. So basically, after I preach, I'm not going to be disqualified. And I watch David discipline his life, and I watch him discipline his habits, and I see the power that flows out of that. And there's something interesting about when we take control of that physical body, and we say to God, I'm offering that to you. There's amazing spiritual power that flows as a result of that. And finally, the sixth point, the sixth step in prayer that I think is so important. If we have a great prayer life, and if we know God, and we know all the scriptures, and we've even had healings, or we've seen God's mighty move, and we take it no further than our own little world, you know what I think God wants to say to us? So what? So what? What? If you don't take that great, wonderful power that you've learned in prayer and pour it back out into a broken and hurting world, so what? I gave you all of this so that your life would be a so that. That's the challenge I want to give you today. As we end right now, I want you to contemplate, like David said, I want you to think about three people in your life that don't know Christ. And we've got, starting Monday, 21 days till Easter, and my challenge to you my challenge to you, people of Forest Hill, Ballantyne, Rock Hill, can you give 21 days to seek God with your whole heart, to read a chapter every day from the Gospel of John, 15 minutes? You can do that in addition to what else you're already reading. I mean, this doesn't have to, you know, supersede your other Bible studies, but would you be willing to read a chapter a day with me? I'm going to do this starting Monday in the Gospel of John and pray for three people that don't know Christ. I truly think miracles can happen. With the size of our church and the numbers of people praying, there is no telling what God might do to spark a movement of prayer throughout this city and maybe even the world. And like I said, when I ended up in the office of the second African president, I thought, man, there is something to praying for God to break your heart for the things that break his. So I'm going to ask David to come up, and we're going to issue this challenge sort of as a closure through prayer. Um, but I just have a sense that God wants to do something really neat at Forest Hill that's going to surprise you individually and then also us as a body. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, I pray that every marriage in here would take each other's hand and do the symphone prayer, the symphony prayer, the one prayer. And I pray, Lord, for those who may not have someone right now with whom they can pray, they would find someone. Father, I ask that everybody in the Forest Hill community of faith, South Park, Ballantyne, and Rock Hill, would all begin to pray the prayer, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. And one of those things, Lord, is the reality that we have friends and family members who don't know you and other people we've never even met who don't know you. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that somehow uh, you would allow people to respond to our prayers in the next 21 days. 
as we read the Gospel of John together, as we seek you, Lord Jesus, so clearly taught as God in human flesh in the Gospel of John, to touch the hearts of people and bring them on our arms on Easter Sunday, Easter Saturday night, and that we would see our friends and our family members come to faith in you. Father, let that be our first step in learning how to pray for those who don't know you, for those who need to know you, for those in our sphere of influence, Lord, please, we ask you, Father, to move powerfully. So thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to pray for people, burden our hearts for them, let us write their names down, let us continue to pray for these next 21 days and even beyond, seeing you use us to bring people into the kingdom of God. Thank you for Marilyn, thank you for her prayer life, and thank you for the answers we've seen and the mysteries that have not yet been answered. We still believe that you're working powerfully. Now, unite this church in prayer, Lord, to reach people who don't know you. It's in the name of Jesus I pray this. Amen. Amen.